Hello, everybody. I have about 10 things going right now. So what we're going to do is just kind of shoot our way around and talk about some of them. First off, uh, if you've been following fundamental trends, you'll notice that there has been a ton of content in the last week or two. Just really uh, can't keep up, to be honest with you. A lot of this stuff uh, is also on margin of safety investing, other than the swing trading and the crypto. Uh, we are uh, incorporating a lot of his major market risk on, risk off into the global trends. So uh, basically the same content except for swing trading and, and cryptocurrency. So what do we want to talk about today? Well, I thought that today would be a good time to go through a tree rings report uh, because even though I think his conclusions are pretty much wrong in the long term and for the most part always have, as you know, I like to make fun of these uh, Austrian type economists who are inflationistas because you know, they were wrong for 40 years, but they're getting their moment in the sun right now because of a pandemic that nobody saw coming and a war that nobody thought would actually come off. So for a hot minute, the inflationistas and the Austrian economists and the supply siders are all right until that stuff is uh, overcome. So they can have their 15 minutes in the, in the sun and they will sell a lot of subscriptions and then they'll be wrong again for another 20 years. So let's get to it. Lowest level of jobless claims since 1968. And why is that? Well, everybody wants to say it's monetary. It's this, it's that, it's the other thing. Folks, it's demographics. Demographics plus the pandemic. There's no other answer. We don't need to say that it has something to do with a chart that nobody understands. Oh, it's the Federal Reserve stimulating. No, no, it's just not. It's just not. These lines move together. Look, just because they're apart at the moment doesn't mean they won't be together soon. This is the unemployment rate in red and the federal surplus or deficit. What does it look like is happening right here? What have I been telling you was going to happen for a long time? Let's see if we can open that bigger, a little bit bigger. What have I told you is going to happen to the federal deficit of the United States? It's going to go down and down and down over the next 15, 20 years. Why is that? It's because boomers are going to start to die. It's because the millennials are going to have uh, low unemployment for the rest of their careers. There's a shortage of people to do all the work. And that's not going to change because of monetary policy. That will change when there's either more robots or more babies. Don't bet on more babies. So as the deficit of a percentage of GDP decreases, and it will, and what have I said is coming, a balanced build back better. That word will be inserted. They all want to talk about how the deficit's going to go up and up and up and up and up. 15%, 20%, 30%. It's not going to happen. It takes very little adjustment to balance the U.S. budget. What happens if they put a 5% tax on marijuana sales? Oh, well, they would never do that. Well, maybe because that's the proposal that just got through the House of Representatives. They need 10 Republican votes to make that a reality. And the Republicans, if you're following along with the cannabis, are basically saying, you know, as long as it remains a state's right to decide whether or not cannabis is legal in that state, we can work out all the financial stuff. That's what's going on. That's why I wrote the article on marijuana this week. And I'm telling you, YOLO or, or MSOS, if you want to go 100% U.S. companies, you ought to be looking at that marijuana cannabis ETF that I showed you. They just started nibbling on in the last couple of months because the legislation is coming to let the cannabis companies into the economy. And once they get in and there's a 5% tax, it basically balances the budget. That's how powerful this is. So what have I told you about the Federal Reserve? A couple of months ago, I said the Federal Reserve was all about reloading their bazooka. We did an entire video on it. The Fed is reloading their bazooka back in November and there was a macro dashes about it, which is coming back next week. Uh, would have come back this week, but we had too much to cover. The Fed just wants to reload their bazooka. So all of the Fed governors, presidents, are out there saying, oh, we have to tighten, we have to tighten, we have to tighten. We're going to tighten literally just as long as it takes, just as long as it takes to bring asset prices back down and slow down growth in demand, just short term. But they can't do it for long. Why? 
because then you kill the supply side. Interest rates go up too high. Companies that have to get the stuff out of the ground and then build it are going to have a hard time financing their operations. So the Fed is going to try to engineer the soft landing. The first step is talking assets down. And since it's impossible to do that sometimes, to shock them. They've already got them jittery this year, very 2018-ish. They need to see asset prices come down. They need to see the price of housing come down. They need more production in oil. They need supply chains to clear up. So here's step one. Get the markets to come down. Get mortgage rates to go up. People are flabbergasted that they're paying over 5% on mortgages right now. Some of them are over 6%. Oh my goodness. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I remember my parents buying their first house in 1979. And it took me until college to understand what was going on, you know, 10 years later. And I asked my dad, so what was your interest rate on your first mortgage as I was learning economics? 17%. And people are freaking out over five and six right now. Funny thing is, this will be back down to three or four in a couple of years. So the Fed was just the largest buyer of treasuries, and now they're going to be a $95 billion a month seller. Actually, that's going to be split up between treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. How can they do that? By the way, I, this is one of the guys I follow on Twitter. He, he runs a family office. He asks the right questions, and he's got family money, so you know he can't screw up too bad. But why is the Fed selling treasuries? It's just going to shock the system like it did in 2018. That's what caused 2018 to be the year that it was. I told you months and months and months ago, it was going to happen this year again. And now it's happening. I told you ahead of time. So these folks make the jump from being an inflationista to being gold bugs. We bought the gold two years ago, and then now it went way up. At least the gold, these Newmont did. Barrick did fair as well. I'm telling people to sell Newmont. Do you really think... The end of the dollar is coming. Here's what's really going on. Liquidity conditions became strained. Liquidity, liquidity. Who talked about liquidity three months ago? So I just want to point out, this is a $1,000 a year subscription over here at Forest for the Trees. And I'm telling you this stuff three months before them. Before the narrative becomes the narrative. Before the breathy, got to get a soundbite in, interviews happen. Totally the Fed was going to do what they're going to do. Totally liquidity was going to be the problem that would drive a correction. And to prove the point that what they're really trying to do is get to have a correction in the stock market. So there's not so much funny money that people feel rich and empowered to keep on spending on stuff that they can't afford. Federal Reserve president says, if stocks don't fall, the Fed needs to force them to fall. Just keep on cutting liquidity until it happens. And then once the crash happens, what do you think is going to happen with the liquidity? It'll stop going down for sure. It probably comes back up. How would that happen? Well, as they cut liquidity, they'll probably break something in the financial system. The thing that breaks usually is the repo market. The Fed knows this. Do you think that's why they put a trillion dollars on the side about eight or nine months ago, which I've talked about several times, to prop up the repo market? There's a trillion dollars earmarked on the side, already authorized, a trillion dollars to bail out the repo market if the Federal Reserve tightening short term breaks anything. In September of 2019, the repo market broke. The Fed started putting money in. It was a one-off form of QE is what it is. It's not directly into the market, but it still gets into the financial system in kind of a more diluted way and less direct. Put a trips in and the stock market started to rally a month later, less than a month later. People want to talk about how sentiment drives the market. That's fine. Talk about it all you want, but I'll tell you what, liquidity drives sentiment. Liquidity speaks, sentiment listens, or follows, or reacts to, or makes up a narrative about. Liquidity is what drives asset prices. Higher liquidity, higher inflation, higher asset prices. Lower liquidity, lower inflation or deflation, lower asset prices. Rinse, repeat, throughout history, going back thousands of years. Neil Howe, from the fourth turning, talked about this in a letter over on Hedgeye. I don't really subscribe to Hedgeye anymore, but I still get some of their free stuff and a couple of things that I know how to backdoor. What Howe talks about is the end of globalization is a bad thing, basically. Could lead to war. He's very subtle about it. I'll be less subtle. Well, I think and have been telling you for four years or five years, I'd have to look 2018 or 17. I wrote the first articles on deglobalization. Is if we deglobalize too much, it'll cause a war. Look at what's happening in Europe right now. 
Now, granted, I think a lot of what's going on with Ukraine and Russia has to do with President Xi doing two things, basically taking advantage of Putin. Xi outsmarted Putin. Xi told Putin, look, we'll buy your oil and gas, and we won't get in the way if you have to do anything else in Europe, particularly Ukraine. So Putin, handshake, wink, wink, nod, nod, says, okay, yeah, yeah, let's work on an oil and gas deal. And two weeks later, he invades Ukraine. Knowing full well that Europe would react roughly the way they've reacted, or weaker, they've reacted probably as strong as you could expect. But Putin's like, ah, but I'm going to sell my oil and gas to China. Well, China now has this oil and gas coming to them because there is no other buyer. India is getting pressure put on them to back away from Russia, which means that there's a lot of natural gas, a lot of biofuel from the United States that's going to go to India. Have we talked about that at all in the last year? Likely to happen? We'll get to that in just a minute. But Neil Howe is one of the premier demographers in history, probably the top demographer in the world right now. And all these things about demographics that I keep talking about, that people keep shaking their head I don't understand. You better start to understand. Slow growth forever is a thing. Deglobalization, if it goes too far, is going to cause a big war. Given that everybody in government and diplomacy knows that, all we have to do is overcome the industrial, the military industrial complex. You know, the one that Eisenhower warned us about. You see, everybody's giving MIGs to Ukraine all of a sudden. I forget which two companies, uh, countries it is. It's uh, Poland and then another one. Who wins from that? Well, it's the company that's going to replace those MIGs with F whatevers. So the military industrial complex is making a lot of money on this. A couple of our stocks that we follow already went way up. We literally had like a week to buy them when they bottomed out and now they're way back up. They'll come back down. You know why? Because at some point, China figures out we should really just cut a deal on Taiwan. Something that lets us save face, have commerce, keep the enemy off the doorstep. And that's something that probably should have happened with Ukraine. Think about this. Ukraine and Russia are basically joined at the hip as a people. And their NATO membership has been pending for, I believe, 14 years. I'd have to go back and check, but it's been a long time. During that entire period, Ukraine could have said, we're going to be a neutral country. We're going to arm ourselves to the teeth just in case. But we're going to give Russia access to Crimea. And we're going to become an international country, a lot like Switzerland. And had they done that back before Russia invaded Crimea, could have avoided a lot of pain. But you had the West and the United States in particular pushing to get Ukraine and NATO. Was that necessary? No. I think there's some very smart people who know the conflict probably won't end the world, at least when it's smaller, and that they can get really, really rich by resupplying everybody with weapons. Newer weapons, more powerful weapons, smarter weapons, just, you know, more weapons. And everybody wants to forget that Russia has been invaded virtually every century for a thousand years. It's not the Mongolians, it's the French. It's not the French, it's the Germans. China feels a lot the same way. How many times has Japan invaded China? Three times? I think so. I have to double check that too, but I know it's been a couple times. It was going on right before World War II. So when people have fears that are well-founded in history and other countries disregard that through policy, through the power that certain industries have within a government, lobbying, whatever it is, and you have populations that are largely ignorant of history by their own laziness and choosing, yet they all have an opinion. You can see where we just have rolling conflicts, little conflicts all over, the, all over the world. Something's always burning. And interestingly, since World War II, there's been fewer and fewer and fewer conflicts. That's true. Fewer, fewer military people deployed, less people dying. Why was that? It's because globalization gave everybody a full pot but they didn't want, not everybody, but they gave more people a full pot, pulled more people out of poverty. When people aren't poor, they want to protect what they have. So while globalization displaced a lot of jobs, it created new jobs. And while I have a lot of empathy for people who have to switch jobs two or three times in a career, not that much. Look, the world changes. If you put yourself on the bottom half of the totem pole for skills from a young age, then that's a decision that you made. So don't come crying to me or to Donnie Trump or to Bernie Sanders that it's those damn foreigners, because it's not. Standard of living has gone up and up and up and up in every single one of your lifetimes. And yet we bitch and moan about things because we saw it on the internet. Or we heard about it from some editorialist on a right-wing or left-wing station or network. Somebody who's just trying to get you to be emotional. Same thing happens in the stock market and investing. The daily traders narrative. This went up because of this. This went down because of that. It's all bullshit. 
In the short term, the herd runs around with their heads cut off like chickens, and four out of five of them lose money, and one out of five like Shooter make money, because he has a better gambling system than they do. He understands how it works. He knows when to cut bait. But four out of five people just think, I'm going to gut it out, because I looked at a chart one time, and I know what five or six of these indicators mean. I'm a chartist now. And yet, they don't have on their chart the one thing that matters the most. Where does institutional interest come from? It comes from the family offices, the hedge funds, the big pensions, sovereign wealth funds, right? Private equity firms. They control over 80% of the money in the, in the global stock market and bond markets. And yet, we run around trying to create a narrative day to day about why that trade happened. Why did that trade happen? What's going to happen next week? But the super rich folks, you know why they're super rich? Because they know just wait for things to get cheap because the idiot retail masses will go screaming and run dir direction when they're happy. FOMO, FOMO, FOMO. They'll go screaming and running off the cliff in the other direction when they're scared. Oh my God, some asshole's doing this to me. No, you're the asshole. Buy great ideas when they're cheap. Because all this stuff, it's narratives meant to sell stuff. While the data Grumman puts in here every week is awesome. The interpretation is lacking. Gets it wrong all the time. And for one or two years, they're going to seem like they're right because we have inflation. But the inflation's coming for only a few reasons. It's the oil. It's the supply chains. Who controls that? Saudi Arabia, Russia, and China. So the limited amount of deglobalization we need to do is just so they can't have that much control. You still want to use comparative advantage because that's why standard of living went up. Everybody found something to do in the economy. And again, I say everybody's not really everybody, but it's more than it was 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years ago. Comparative advantage, Google that. When you talk about comparative advantage, United States is at the top of most of those lists. Technology, finance, manufacturing, materials, food. We live on the best rock on the planet. That's why I only put about 10 to 15% of my money overseas. And most of that is emerging markets. So as they lay out these articles, whether it's this one or somebody else doing the same sort of thing, they want to inflame your emotions because they know that you'll keep subscribing because every week you got to get your fix. They give you a crappy stock pick and crappy ETF pick, a crappy narrative over and over and over again, but you buy into it. And yet here we are picking out stocks that are going to make some people millionaires. And I know that because I saw it happen firsthand. These narratives don't matter much. And I'll tell you, you are only one in five likely to make money as a trader. So if you have any emotions at all, you're going to lose. You have to have a system. You have to have a process. You have to think of it like gambling because that's what it is. Some gamblers win. I know a guy that every time he goes to Vegas, he walks out with thousands of dollars. I don't understand how he does it. I tried to copy him. I couldn't figure it out. It was one or two wrong bets I made, and I went from making money to losing money. So certain indicators are starting to talk about a recession. Do you believe the Fed's going to keep tightening until we get a recession? Does it make any sense for them to do that when they say they just need stock market and housing prices to come down? We have surplus jobs at this point. So if some of the surplus jobs, if some of these companies decide, well, instead of 6 million job openings, they're going to go down to 4 million job openings. And there weren't enough for 6 million. There's not enough for 4 million. There's only enough people to fill 2 million jobs. They have a big cushion between the jobs available and the people that can actually take them. And I say can because really you can say that a million millennial men are supposed to go to work. But if they haven't done it at 40, what makes you think they're really part of the workforce or the potential workforce? They're lazy or they're dumb or they're whatever. They're just not going to do it. They're going to keep living off their parents as long as they can and hopefully inherit money so they can retire from retirement. And I'm saying this, and you all know I'm a pretty liberal guy. But let's get into reality land. Putin's trying to break the dollar. Do you know why? Because he's too stupid to know that he can't. Our last president wanted to talk about how smart Putin was. Putin's an imbecile. Our last president was an imbecile. I don't care who you voted for. Dumb is dumb. Stupid is as stupid does. Putin went into, Russia, into Ukraine thinking he's going to win that war quickly. Not only was it not quickly, but he's lost. He didn't get to replace the government of Ukraine. He didn't take anything in the West. And he's going to have to expend all of his resources to win in the East. And you know what? If we wanted to, if we thought it was worth the risk, it would take us all of a day, maybe two days to wipe out all of his troops. But then Russia would hate us. So right now, the rebuke of Russia is coming from the Ukrainians who have a close tie to Russia, who can impose some moral authority without being cast as the great oppressor, as those imperialists from America. Granted, they're using our weapons and the missiles that are going over there right now as we speak 
they can be launched from a greater distance and targeted very handily on all the armor that's now moving from west to east in Ukraine. And it's kind of funny that Russia is demanding rubles. Do you really think that China is going to pay them in rubles? Maybe. Maybe China decides this guy is so stupid that the rubles that we bought for way cheaper, well, yeah, sure, we'll buy his gasoline and his oil and his, and his gas. But now that he doesn't have any other markets to sell into, maybe we should renegotiate that price. Ah. So I started off earlier in the, in the conversation talking about how Xi outsmarted Putin two ways. Xi got Putin into a much weaker position in every respect and then became his only buyer, big buyer, for oil and gas. Who's smart, Xi or Putin? Yeah. Do you think that Xi doesn't see that there's probably a deal he should cut on Taiwan at this point? Something along the lines of you just keep your weapons away from us. Give us the ability to move our ships through certain areas and make Taiwan a, a true international city, country, city state. I, I'm not really sure how big Taiwan's landmass is. It's not that big. But you can't take a bridge to get there like you can with Hong Kong. So taking over anything that's an island is real difficult. I mean, you can, you can blow it into oblivion, but you might not be able to take it over. So as you take a look at what's happening versus what's going to happen, start asking yourself, who really is smarter? Who's really making demands that mean anything? Putin's days are numbered. And at some point, Russia's going to say sorry. They might even pull out of Crimea someday. And they're going to say, hey, we're going to pull out of Crimea in eastern Ukraine. And we just want some assurances about transportation and finance and access to global markets. Because a year or two from now, when China's paying them less for their oil and gas, and they don't have a lot of other trading partners, Russia could be in trouble. And that makes them dangerous. And that's why Putin's going to be gone. Because the Russians don't want to die either, right? This is a joke. This is a joke. In the United States, as we get to some of our investment ideas, it's basically telling India, don't fall for it. Don't buy the energy. We'll figure something out. Maybe, right? Maybe there is some energy for you that we can find. Get to that in one second. We're almost there. Commodities could go up another 40%. They could if the Federal Reserve makes it financially difficult to mine and process by making money too expensive. I'm just going to tell you right now, I believe that they're going to shock the system. The Fed is going to shock the system. A couple of half point increases, three or four or five months of tightening the balance sheet. Then as soon as we get the corrections that they want, as soon as the funny money is out of the system and probably we break something in banking or high finance, that repo money, that trillion dollars is laying there. It's going to start sifting its way into the market and they're going to stop QT. And they're going to go from QE to QT, back to QE light. And I think it all happens this year because they can't let this happen. And it'll take people a year or two to start spending again. Just saw it with my daughter. Remember what I told you about her? Suddenly she has to pay taxes and, you know, suddenly it's hard to spend everything that you earn. Because, oh my, taxes are real. And business income goes up and down. Lots of things moving around. Somebody in one of our chat rooms talked about that today. Their wife is a real estate agent. For, you know, 2020, she didn't sell many properties. And then suddenly in 2021, she sold a ton, kind of threw her tax planning out of whack a little bit. But she knows that 2022 won't be as nearly as big a year as 2021. So they're, they're, they're working through that. There's examples of that all over the place. Aggregate demand is going to flatten out this year. Might even come down a shade. That's all it's going to take, along with more oil and supply chains clearing up and a little bit of the supply chains moving back to the United States, another couple percent, because that's all, that's all it's moving. Talked about a lot of that here. So let's talk about some investments. 20-year treasury is something to watch. It's something that Shooter trades over on Fundamental Trends, and I'll be covering it a little bit more at margin of safety. Why? Because I think over the next six months, you're going to see a couple of things break, and you can make a lot of money when things break, either on the downside, the upside when it comes back, or both. And then you can choose whether you want to take the risk of betting on the downside, because that is very time sensitive. When you're a short investor, you have to be very precise on the timing. If you don't want to take that risk, that's okay. Most of you shouldn't. On the long side, you don't have to be precise. You just have to be accurate. What's the difference? Precise is time sensitive. Accurate is long term. I know that clean energy is going to crush fossil fuels in the next, you know, for the next 30, 40, 50 years, probably forever. But I don't know exactly which years will always be the best for fossil fuels versus clean energy. 2020, clean energy crushed fossil fuels. 2021 was the other way around. They're kind of tracking each other right now. Which one do you think breaks out next year? I have my feeling. 
It's not a feeling. It's an analysis, right? What's going on with the gas? Well, we talked about New Fortress Energy. You know where this article's from? March of 2021. We started buying it in the summer of 2021. Look at that. Started accumulating it. Most of us have a cost basis around 20. And it's in the middle 40s now. Why is this an important company? Why? Did we guess? Or did we know that natural American natural gas is going to be a big deal? We found a small company run by a billionaire. Very quiet. Not your tweeting type of billionaire. More the type of billionaire that brings you Giannis and you know the Milwaukee Bucks championship and a whole new downtown in Milwaukee. That kind of guy. Quiet guy. He invests his own money from Fortress Capital into a natural gas company. What does this natural gas company do? Well, they have a way of loading liquefied natural gas from a barge. Don't have to build a giant facility like down in New Orleans and, and Saving Pass, the Chenier did. These guys can float a facility out to where the gas is in the ocean, liquefy it and put it on a ship right, right there, cutting out all kinds of steps and all kinds of expenses. And they have facilities on land that are for now natural gas, but they're able to be converted into hydrogen. What's the big push now in transportation and energy storage? Hydrogen. Not blue hydrogen, but green hydrogen. The type that's produced without any emissions. That's where government policy is going. So these guys jump in there. Another company that we got into was a Metis. Most of you have a single digit cost basis in this one. You first talked about a Metis way back here, summer of 2021. Huh, look at that. Did we guess? No, we knew. It doesn't matter that there was a war in Ukraine. Some things get sped up. Some things pull the action towards them. What do I mean by that? The power of, of, of narrative isn't that it's really trying to explain something that's happening. It's more trying to rationalize what's already happened or what's coming. The chant of today will have an uh, uh, element of truth, a morsel. But really what it's doing is trying to let you know, hey, there's a problem over there and something's going to break. So Metis, which has that big plant in India, bio, biofuels, the whole carbon capture and biofuel setup in California that I think just got them their fifth contract with a major airline at the San Francisco Air, airport for jet fuel. Right, they're on to something. Look at this. Resistance breaks through it. Support, 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 support. Look at that. That whole area there. Resistance turns into support. The Metis is about to break out. So I've already been starting. A lot of you should have puts that are expiring tomorrow that you sold for two bucks is going to expire worthless. That's two bucks. It's just in your pocket. You didn't have to buy anything. Just made a huge annualized return on your cash. What you do is you just sell another cash secured put. So I've been selling the July $15 cash secured puts on a Metis. And I'm really hoping that there's a dip in here. So some of the stock gets put to me. And at some point there will be, you know how I know that? Cause I lived through exact sciences and 20 other stocks that I've done this with. There'll be enough volatility that at some point a put will get put to you and you'll have a bigger position in the stock. Cause right now I only have 1% position in the stock, but if every one of the puts got put to me, I'd have an 8% position. A couple of them are expiring tomorrow, so I'll sell new ones next week. I'm just going to keep on staggering the puts because I know that companies like New Fortress Energy and Ametis have a big future. Now, where's New Fortress going to come to? Well, they should have a correction back down into this range. And in fact, this probably needs to come up. This probably needs to come up. It'd be something like this. I will I will work on this. But Ametis down in the 30s, lower 30s, it's probably a gift around 30. That's the energy stocks that we picked. What else is going on? What else do I want you to make sure you're in? What did I tell you about what was going to happen with the satellites? That the first movers were going to make money because at some point the government's going to step in and say enough is enough. You can't put any more satellites up there. It's interfering with things. It's becoming dangerous. So those four satellite stocks plus EST Space Mobile, so different type of satellite, those five companies are way ahead of the competition about 20 companies on a planet putting up constellations. And as I said, I think that Black Sky and Spire make a lot of sense to merge. Palantir might drive that. We'll see. Somebody sent them a letter so, you know, describing that. I sent a lot of letters to companies because I like to see what the response is. Usually there's no response. Sometimes I get an interview. Sometimes I get a response. It's usually a canned letter. Thanks for your thoughts, Mr. Spano. I did get one a long time ago saying, uh, how do you feel about coming to, to work with us? But the problem was that uh, company's uh, game stopped and uh, they went through a couple of other CEOs. <laughs> anyway, 
the satellite stocks that we have are so cheap right now that you need to be buying them. Planet is trading for about half its last private funding round. So not the not the SPAC price, but the price that the late stage private investors, the hedge funds and private equity firms paid. It's very, very rare that you can get a, a lower price than them. And right now on Planet, you can. Satellogic, which clearly has brilliant management, it's due to the teeny tiny share buyback to blow up the shorts. So on any market weakness, you want to buy Satellogic too. So you want to own all four of the stocks. And then in the amount that you're willing to risk, Black Sky and Spire, probably a higher risk, but they are pretty neat companies. So they got a lot of upside. Planet, because they're in bed with Google, probably the lowest risk. Uh, Satellogic's not far behind them though, because they got great technology and really good management. And AST Space Mobile, Right? That's the one that could blow them all away, but it could also crash and burn if the technology doesn't work for getting cellular communications directly to a cell phone. But you would think we've been selling or sending satellite communications to the earth for decades. You would think at some point the technology would get good enough that it wouldn't require a base station. It could just require a supercomputer that you hold in your hand. Remember, our cell phones are 10 times more powerful than what sent us to the moon. So these satellite stocks, I hope you're embracing them. I hope you're selling puts. I hope you have starter positions because in the long run, I don't know which one it's going to be or which two or three, but there's going to be companies that go up four, five, six hundred percent, and some of them might go up a thousand percent or more. You've got three, four, five, ten, twenty baggers here, and the one that doesn't do well, and I'll say there'll be one because there always is, probably gets merged and you probably come out even. Black Sky and Spire at two bucks a share, and they're sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars. They'll figure something out. All right, a couple other things. Cryptocurrency, here's the headline you need to know. 84% of institutional investors see digital assets going mainstream, right? 84%. So I've been telling you since summer of 2020 to buy some Bitcoin with your bank savings money. And if you had done that around 10 or 15 or 20,000, you'd be very happy. Now I'm telling you, in your IRAs or your other investment accounts, if you want to put a single digit percentage, probably start out real small. Is it a grayscale Bitcoin trust? You probably should. Do you know why? Right? I just told you why. I think you should start scaling into this. So over the course of this year, a lot of things are going to happen. And one of them is that now that we have the first movers in the Bitcoin among the institutions, and a handful of the family offices have done it, right? The first brave ones have stuck their toes in. And the first ones that dove in all the way, everybody thought, oh, they're crazy. But they made money. So other investors stuck their toes in. And now they're starting to get up to their ankles. And other people on the beach are saying, hey, what are they doing? Well, nobody's getting eaten by a shark. Maybe we should figure this out. And there is going to be some retail selling when the regulations come out saying that, hey, every transaction is taxed unless you're using a stable coin. So if you do sell a Bitcoin, so let's say you sell a whole Bitcoin that's worth 100 grand at the time and you paid 20 you're going to pay a capital gains tax. It's not going to be practical to use Bitcoin to buy your pizza, not in this country anyway, and not in China because they already banned it. Bitcoin is a long-term store of wealth, and that's why the family offices and certain institutions are interested. For them, it's that 2 3 4 5% of money that they don't want to put into equities or bonds, but they don't want it to get devalued to inflation. Granted, as I've said, I think people are way too afraid of inflation because inflation is, in fact, transitory, it's just that what? Inflation is transitory, but what is permanent? Inflation is transitory, meaning it's going to end relatively soon, probably by next year, get back down to two-ish percent. But that doesn't mean that a whole bunch of price levels are going to come down. Some asset prices will come down for a little while, but the price of beef, the price of gasoline, the price of a lot of things are going to be in a new higher range. It's like steps. It's not a ramp. So it's not smooth. Prices went down for a long, long time. Went down, up. Uh, we'll go like this again. There'll be a crisis down the road and they'll jump up again for whatever reasons, whatever the circumstances are at the time. Between now and then, there's going to be massive adoption of Bitcoin, mainly by the wealthy and by the corporation. So the institutions and the wealthy who control 80% of the money in the world are starting to dip their toes in. Some of them are up to their ankles. Really only Michael Saylor is up to his shoulders. There's going to be a lot more of them up to their ankles the next two or three years. The way that these things happen is that they wait for the regulations to be official or almost official. Why do you think a lot of family offices and hedge funds have started to invest in cannabis again after a couple of years? It's because they watch Congress the way I watch Congress. They know 
that there's some sort of legislation coming and it's being negotiated right now. They need 10 Republicans, which they've gotten before, to say, okay, here's the compromise we're willing to do. The Democrats will take it. They'll, they'll take the best they can. And the main thing is that all that money gets into the financial system and all those stocks that are listed in Canada right now, because they can't list on a U.S. exchange, are going to list in U.S. exchanges. So all those stocks that I covered in that article on YOLO, you saw that they're traded with swaps or ADRs. So they can't list in America just yet. They're going to fix that. And all these businesses in cannabis are going to be able to take a credit card and do online transactions and deal with banks directly. None of that's happening right now. If you go to a, a distribution facility, I forget what they're called, and you go to buy some weed, you're paying cash. In almost every situation. So what are they called? Uh, dispensaries. Yeah. It's not something I do very often. I've done the research a couple times in Vegas just to see what they look like. And I will tell you, some of them are pretty nifty. They look like Apple stores. But we were just in Phoenix and people we were with wanted to go. So I drove and it was like a freaking big garage. <laughs> it was a big pole barn, a little warehouse, you know, so some places are neater than others. I didn't, didn't go into that one. In any case, cannabis, Bitcoin, satellites, natural gas companies, fuel companies, biofuels. You need to be in all those things. Let's finish up with Uncle Elon. What did Uncle Elon do today that I talked about last week? He made a full offer on Twitter. And Prince Alawid said it's not nearly enough. So we've been flirting with Twitter a long time. I didn't like it because Jack Dorsey was involved. I just didn't think he was a good CEO. And I'm not so sure that the current guy is a great CEO. But I think he just got a shock to the system. But he also got good news. Over 80% of people said that they would stay with Twitter regardless of who owned it. Prince Aloui is saying that it's worth at least double from where it is now. He's a pretty smart guy. He's a long-term investor, though. He'll wait for it. He, he can afford to. He's, what, the 20th richest person on the planet. He can wait. So I sold $41 June puts today. I put that in the chat room, both chat rooms. And I bought um, basically a full position on Twitter. I started with one position. I put a stop loss order on it and the market moved so much that I got stopped out, but I was able to buy it back cheaper. So the stop actually saved me like nine cents a share, which is weird. But even if this deal doesn't close, I think it shows there's a lot of interest. And this other guy who knows tech pretty well says that every major tech company is going to try to get in on this by buying it out from under Elon Musk. So who could buy Twitter? I will tell you what, my dark horse is Benioff over at Salesforce. That's my dark horse because he owns time and he could use that as a platform for distributing his own news. I don't think Amazon could buy them because of their ownership of the Washington Post. I don't think Google and Facebook would be allowed to buy them either. Maybe Microsoft, but they own LinkedIn and they just own so much stuff already. I had to guess I'd say Salesforce, Benioff is going to buy this or it'll be somebody foreign or it'll be a group. But I think it's going to be for a higher price if it gets bought. And Elon Musk can just sell his shares when the next offer comes in. Or he can say, nah, I'm good. Let's cut a deal. You guys run this thing. Respect my wishes. I'll hold on to my shares. And I'll keep tweeting so people keep coming. Right? There's all sorts of things that could play out. The hardest thing is figuring out what everybody's real agenda is and just you know how into themselves they are, which is usually pretty much. So if you're truly a long-term investor, and you've been trying to understand how technology and news and publishing and entertainment are all going to blend into together. You've been watching it. I've been covering it with you with Warner for three years. Twitter is going to be a winner in the long term. I don't know how they'll do it, but they already have everything almost in place. They need to build out a little faster. They need to be a little bit less stubborn. And I think this is a shock to the system they needed. What's the downside on Twitter? 30-something a share, probably maybe 20-something a share. I mean, they'd have to do a lot of things wrong. But everybody wants it. I've been saying that for a while. I should have just bought it in the teens when I first talked about it and then shut up and waited. That's what I should have done. One of the things that tipped me off that I should have got back into this sooner is that it was such a big deal for Trump. Now it's such a big deal for Musk. It's a big deal. 200 million users. And this could be the platform that challenges a lot of other platforms around the world. I think Musk is right and that Twitter should be a, a freedom of speech thing. But remember, freedom of speech doesn't mean you can say whatever you want. That's not what that means. We should still regulate and suppress blatant propaganda that's based on falsehoods, things that are demonstrably false. Anything in the gray zone, hey, say it as much as you want. If you're flat out lying, and we know that you're flat out lying, 
and it's meant as a form of propaganda or to convince people to buy something they shouldn't buy, like a stock, like saying, hey, I got a deal to finance taking Tesla private, which is a clear SEC violation. I mean, Musk can say, well, I can say whatever I want, but that's not how the SEC works. When you register a security, you promise not to mislead people. He broke that law. So he can whine all he wants and use this as a power play, which I think partially it is. But he did expose something that's probably very true, that it's a very valuable entity and somebody's probably going to figure out how to buy it and run it better and increase its value. My guess is that somebody else buys it, Musk keeps his stake, and he remains a very popular figure on Twitter. And he will have gained a little bit more freedom to say what he wants to say. And he can, he'll have to worry about the SEC, but he won't have to worry about getting censored. We'll see. All right. Somebody asks, what is your advice on 401k asset allocation? I've said it twice. I've written it out. Say it again. I think you should be very, very heavy in cash with your balance. I don't think you should really ever change your contributions. The contribution should always be going into those two or three funds that are aggressive all the time. In a few times a decade, you accumulate a bunch of cash. You've got the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve presidents talking about that they need to force stocks to come down. When the Federal Reserve says we're going to force stocks to come down, you should probably expect stocks to come down. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be investing them all the way through. Your dollar cost averaging with your contributions. Just leave those alone. Pick out two or three funds that are very aggressive, that have done very well over the long haul, and just keep dollar cost averaging into those two or three funds. Large cap growth, small cap growth, emerging markets generally. But I don't think it hurts to go up to 75% in cash with your balance, especially if you're close to retirement. If you're not that close to retirement, you don't have much of a balance, don't bother. You're middle-aged like me, and you know you care about taking a 20 or 30% loss, but you know it probably won't change your life much. You know, you pull back, you'd make a tactical transition. It's a scale, right? If you're young with a low balance, there's not much managing you have to do. Just keep putting money in there at the highest pace that you can. Don't ever cut your contributions. Oh, the market's going down. I'm going to stop putting money in. I've heard people say that over and over again. Always, always look to increase your contributions in your 401k, especially if the stock market's going down, because that's when things are cheap. We know the stock market goes up 80% of the time. But as you get older, your balance gets bigger. You want to make some tactical changes every now and then, a couple times a decade, three times a decade. This is one of those times. I thought this was all going to happen way sooner, but the Fed just poured so much money into the system that it got asset prices up and helped us avoid a depression. And they erred on the side of avoiding the depression. Should they have stopped putting money into QE sooner than they did? I know a lot of people say they should have. However, I think that they did it just about right because they bought themselves the cushion they needed to tighten to bring asset prices down without, without killing the economy. Shocking the system shouldn't kill the economy. Oh, I had something up here from Hard Energy. I'll just tell you what it was because I don't see it. I keep telling you that there's going to be 800,000 to a million more barrels of oil coming from the American market pretty soon. Yeah, it's happening. They're hiring, they're drilling more, all the ducks, right? All the uh, drilled but uncompleted wells, they're opening them all up and, and getting them uh, producing. They've been accumulating those duck wells for years, right? They drill it, they put the pipe in, but they don't frack it. They don't have the oil come out. Well, now they're just going to pipe the pipe, the pipe, boom, oil, boom, oil, boom, oil. And we just gave Chevron the ability to negotiate a deal with Venezuela for heavy oil to refill the strategic petroleum reserve. They didn't publicize it. I suppose that's because of the politics. But Chevron's going to cut a deal with Venezuela to bring heavy sour over here to put into our strategic petroleum reserve and make sure that our refineries can run properly. And there's a misconception that the refineries are the same today as they were 20 years ago. They're not. For the last 20 years, our refineries have been adding the capacity to use light, sweet crude and do blending. And we're getting to the point now where our ability to blend with higher light sweet and lower heavy sour is almost, you know, the light sweet component has roughly doubled since the early 2000s. And just like China knows what we know and what the oil companies know, is that in about seven, eight years, nine years, 10 years, right in that range, right around 2030, plus or minus a year or two, demand destruction for oil will occur. In between now and then, the panic pumping will start. I think we're at the front end of that. What is panic pumping? Panic pumping is countries that need the revenue or the cheap energy that have oil are going to use it while they can. 
And first, they won't be able to sell it. Then eventually, they won't be using it. Step-by-step -step process. They're going to take 20 years, 30 years. But demand for oil is going to fall in the 2030s. It will fall. And 20 years from now, demand for oil is going to be about half. There's 30 million barrels a day coming out of the ground from conventional wells that will still be pumping in 20 years. That means they only got to find 20 million barrels a day somewhere in 20 years. But, but we're going to need natural gas a little bit longer. So there's a day coming. It might be sooner than later, probably in the 2030s. Natural gas is getting expensive again because the associated natural gas is going to go down. So between now and 2030s, you're going to see hydrogen ramp up, but it won't ramp up fast enough to miss having another one of those two, three year periods where we're iffy on what kind of energy, you know, where are we in the transition? It'll be wavy. Think of the long run assets as investments and the short run assets as trades. Pretty easy. All right, I'll let you go. Have a great night, folks.